Thinking about your next trip? Come and explore the unique culture of Japan. Be sure to check out the JAL Japan Explorer Pass by Japan Airlines. With this fixed low fare, you can travel all over Japan from Okinawa to Hokkaido. So skip the long train rides and explore more of Japan, starting with Japan Airlines world renowned service. For more details, click on the display banner now. Japan Airlines. Blog Talk Radio. Alternative facts. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified objects of unknown intent and unknown origin were detected at high altitudes over multiple locations of Earth's outer space by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and these objects are presumed to be some form of controlled aircraft. It is not known if more of these aircraft will arrive or if they will attempt entering Earth's atmosphere. United States citizens are encouraged to monitor local media outlets, as more updates will follow as information becomes available. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. Attacks by the undead have been reported in several states across the country. The dead are rising from their graves and are attacking the human race. At this time, it is expected that more attacks of this nature will occur in several other states in the next few hours. The intent behind the attack is unknown at this time. He has been observed that a bug for exchange of fluids is a method of transmission. This is an extremely dangerous situation if they crave the taste of human flesh. It is not known whether this event will last for hours, days, or even longer. Stay calm, as authorities have been dispatched to deal with these creatures. An all-clear siren will be sounded when this situation is under control. Welcome to Within the Chaos with your host, Rodney Shortridge, and co host, Robin Dalton. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. You can listen in by going to blogtalkradio.com forward slash Within the Chaos or listen in by phone. You can dial 323 870. 4197. And you can also call in to ask questions to our guests at the same number, 323-870-4197. From deep within the heart of the Appalachians, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you all for listening to Within the Chaos. My name is Rodney Shortridge and I'll be your host tonight, along with my fiery redhead co-host, 
Robin Dalton. Uh, hello, Douglas. Hello. Ah, there you are. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, I think I'm having some a little more trouble with blog talk, but they're trying to work all the problems. Certainly. Uh, can, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and you know what started you on this journey to becoming a writer? Uh, well, let's see. I've always liked to read. Uh, you know, I've really enjoyed fiction reading. Uh, it's not that I really planned to become a writer, but uh, uh, I had vampiric people on my heart even from a very young age. And thinking about them, praying for them, and so forth, I started to understand and see things. In 1983, I took a little fiction writing class. Uh, I also started seeing that summer. And what was essentially the second little short story I wrote in my class was essentially the ending of the first novel-length story. The, when I write about vampiric people, I'm writing about living people uh, that go through a physical change that turns them into a blood drinker. And the storyline itself is about a female vampiric person by the name of Macon. And uh, at the time the story takes place, it's 1993, and it goes to about 1998. And it's her relationship with this young man by the name of Thomas. And Thomas does not know who or what she really is when he meets her and all of this, but he finds out. And he's exposed to her blood at the end of the first story, and he becomes vampiric himself, starting with the second story. Uh, the storyline itself is essentially uh, 16 novel-length stories. And when I finished a little writing class over the next two months, I saw what would be the equivalent of the 16 novel-length stories. I saw Macon, I saw Thomas, I saw his sister, I saw Janine, Alicia, Nolan, Stephen, Thomas's parents. And so, like I say, in 1983, I just saw it. Okay, how's that? Better. That okay. Uh, like I said, sometimes I have a little trouble with them. Uh, what I was asking uh, about your dreams uh, that plagued yes. you for years, did is that where you come up with your characters? No. Okay. So these are real life people that you know? Nope. They're real life people in my imagination. Oh, okay. So, what can you tell us about your dreams that have plagued you? Well, I mean, as a young person, say about seven or eight years old, I started dreaming of myself dying. It was always rather impersonal, you know, like falling, um, crushed, uh, lightning, that sort of thing. And uh, I, for the most part these days, I don't really remember much. And today, even today, it's rare that I dream even today. But about the time of high school, I said I'm not having these dreams anymore, and they stopped. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't live there like that anymore, and I'm thankful for that because it was not not a happy place to be with all that. But I. Uh, I didn't die, and so praise God, I'm still here. Mm -hmm. So what do you think these dreams mean? Oh, I think the devil was just trying to pull my chain and get me to die, mm -hmm. pretty much. I understand that you're a Christian. So yeah. how does your religion play in the role in your writing? I think you should love anybody and everybody and everybody should have the right to say that Jesus is Lord and come to him regardless of what they are and vampiric people even themselves making herself uh, became a Christian in the sacrifices story mm -hmm. and in the second story you meet a very godly girl by the name of Janine who happens to be vampiric 
and she just was a very godly girl that essentially got stuck. And that's how you should think of them, someone that's stuck in a situation. Mm-hmm. So what's the difference between a vampire and a vampire? Well, like I say, the, for the people who can't uh, look at what you're looking at, when I spell it, just for your, your listeners, I say V-A-M-P-Y-R to denote a living person. Now, most people have Dracula on the brain, which means if I say vampire, the image that pops in most people's head is an undead Dracula-type creature that rises out of a coffin and drinks the blood of the living. But in the second story, as Janine was thinking about her life and how she became vampiric, she came to the conclusion very quickly that uh, she was living she was not undead, and just like the scripture says, when uh, the rich man died and he called to his father Abraham to let Lazarus bring him some water, and Abraham said, there's a gulf fixed between us. We can't come to you, and you can't come to us. So she came to the conclusion that dead was dead, and that was it. And so these people that say that vamp- vampires are undead uh, they're not coming back as people because people don't come back. Hmm. Well, how does someone become, you know, vampiric? Well, in the storyline, Thomas became vampiric and Macon became vampiric uh, because, like, he was exposed to her blood in that fight. Uh Early on, the Lord gave me a scripture to to help explain this. It's in the Old Testament in the book of Joel, Joel 2, verse 2. It talks about a day of darkness, gloominess, clouds, and thick darkness. I think those four things is the vampiric expression in the earth. Uh, The darkness path has something to do with the occult usually in Macon's case her father had occultic runes around his neck and he operated in fear and so it it really transmits more like a curse although in the second story I describe it as a vampiric medical condition to to emphasize the physical changes they go through Mm -hmm. but largely it's uh, transmitted as a curse Okay. Well, have you had any personal experiences, you know, uh, that would classify as personal? Uh, 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 shoot, sorry, I've had a long day. Uh, paranormal? Well, uh, you know, most of what I know of vampiric people comes from Macon herself, who happens to be the lead character in the story. Uh one or two instances of seeing a vampiric person, uh, I saw one at Walmart once. He was cool. with friends. He looked like a normal person. It was in the middle of the afternoon. And by all accounts, looking at him, you wouldn't know that he was vampiric. You wouldn't just know that. But that day, I just knew it. And so, uh, is there a certain way... That you can tell? In my case, I just knew. Oh, okay. But like I say, uh, you know, for all intent purposes, they look like just like normal people, and they do their best to blend in. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to appear normal. They have to be under radar to survive. What, what's your opinion about people... You know, the type of reaction they have seeing someone drinking blood. Oh, people, first of all, if you were to see someone literally drink blood, it will mess you up emotionally Mm -hmm. at some point. Uh, I don't know what that reaction is because I've never had it. I've just been told that that's how people react to seeing someone drink blood. Well, um, are vampiric people 
are they some kind of cult? Well, the the trick of all of this is that there are many, many more. Now, when I say a vampiric person in this storyline, I'm talking about a person that's gone through the change, and they're mm-hmm. physically changed. Their body has changed. Their organs have changed. They're they're now literally a blood drinker. Uh, but there are many, many more human blood drinkers, literally, than true vampiric ones. And out of the human blood drinkers, you got people of all types, for all reasons, thinking that this is a cool thing to do, or they're just mean people anyway. Uh, but there are many more human blood drinkers than true vampiric ones. Mm-hmm. So when did you start writing? I started writing in 1983. 1983. Okay, so where did you come up with this idea for for the storyline? Well, like I say, I saw Macon first. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the initial novel length story, uh, Silently Comes the Night, she arrives in the city of Trenton and she she has to get blood rather quickly because she's been deprived for some days. And so she lures a predator to come after her. And this guy and this group of men are co- trying to corner this woman in this alley. And she kills him and drinks his blood and then climbs up the side of the building demonstrating right off that she's stronger than a normal person. She can be dangerous. And, you know, this guy thought he was going to prey on her, but it didn't turn out the way he thought. The second thing I saw of Macon was a flashback into her youth. She was attacked and raped when she was about 13, almost 14 years old. And the young man that she was in love with the guy that was attacking her, he was, she was sort of tied down to the slab thing, and he was raping her, but her, the man, the young man she loved was stabbing him to get her out from under him, and so his blood got on her as he was trying to get her away, and so she remembers this man as the beast. And this is in her story back in the historical part of it. But I saw that. And I saw largely the ending uh, where she's fighting John in this uh, forest next to a cliff. And there's this old house there. In our day, it would be like a two-story house. But in its day, it was more like a mansion. So that's what we called it in the story even though it's really like an old home that's out in the woods, it's run down. But she's fighting John uh, and trying to keep Thomas from dying in the process, and she's he, he cuts her, and uh, she's bleeding, and she's helping Thomas get up the hill, and her blood gets on him without either of them knowing it until John attacks them again. But essentially, I just started seeing it. Mm -hmm. And like I say, after I finished the little uh, fiction writing class, over the next two months, I continued to see what happened before. I continued to see what happened after. And within the two months, I had seen the equivalent of, uh, you know, the full Mm storyline. And so I just saw it. Well, have you learned anything strange or unusual about vampires that people don't know? Well, like I say, most people have Dracula on the brain, and I don't I don't know how hard or how easy it is for, for you to come to grips that people like this do exist and can exist. They... They're very lonely. They're very. They're in a bad place. They have to hunt to survive, and what you are literally looking at is a physically changed, blood-drinking human predator. 
Mm-hmm. Now, to keep people from just panicking at this point, I point out that they know not to just go killing wildly, you know, because uh, the person that they kill today is the person that will not be around a month from now from the, for them to get blood again. So they know not to go killing off their food source, hopefully. Those that turn into killers, as John was in the first story, those don't tend to survive very long. Mm-hmm. So uh, largely it's just uh, – I'm just fascinated with making herself really because she's just remarkable, I think. I think that the reason that she survived – for so long and you learn in the second story at the time the story took place she was born in the winter of uh, 1698 so she was 900 and uh, no 294 years old when the story took place starting and I think I think that most of her decisions why not being a perfect person had to be most of her decisions had to be the right choices for her to survive and I just like her anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, have you ever been physically or emotionally or spiritually attacked, you know, by an unknown entity? Oh, well, let's see. Are you thinking like what, psychic vampire sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A psychic vampire, I might as well just throw this out there is a person operating with a physical manifestation of a religious spirit. Um, Because that's what religion does. It sucks the life out of everything living to keep itself alive. Uh, Those in the church have authority over spirits like this in their manifestation. So I say to the church, just cast the religious spirit out and get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Not even a big problem. Okay. Well, uh, would you say that vampires, due to their violent nature, would automatically go to hell? No. No? Because God's grace is bigger than that. Because like I say, Macon herself received Jesus as Lord in the sacrifices story. Her prayer was literally, Lord, save me, and he did. Well, can you explain the wolf as your logo and the phrase, without love, nothing changes? Okay, the uh, silently publishing uh, logo is a wolf howling, as you described. But underneath, I put the words, without love, nothing changes. That connects the world of the darkness and the things that makes most people afraid with the world of God, because God's world is love. And so the reason that I write this storyline and the reason that I, you know, even attempt any of this, first of all, I think the Lord wants me to do it. And second of all, I think that it's important for people, human people, to understand what vampiric people are like. And so I'm giving you a window that you can look through to understand them better uh, surely before you meet one It's a good mm-hmm. idea to know Well would a vampire Person still need To drink blood even if they've been saved Yes Making herself as vampiric Even to this day And she is still a blood drinker But she is also a devout Christian hmm. What does the church Say about A, va- 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 a vampire person well when i go to a church um you know like i have these stories out there and Mm -hmm. i have other information on my website when it's finally put back up uh like to ministries that are interested in in vampiric people in ministry like that but largely when i go to the leadership of the church and i ask them uh you know, this is the story that I've written. Would you please read it and give me guidance in terms of its scriptural accuracy? Uh, they usually don't respond. If I ask for a time with their leadership to 
explain this project. They typically don't answer, or they're too busy, or they don't respond, or they quietly show me the door. So all in all, by now, only a few people have really listened, and uh, most have not. Wow. Well, can someone that is vampire give up drinking blood? No. If they've gone through the change, uh, I describe it in my um, information like your body has an addiction to oxygen. If someone tried to cure you of your addiction to oxygen, you will die. Mm -hmm. Blood is just as vital for them because... uh, you know, they have to have blood for sustenance to survive from then on. Well, what is the lifespan of someone that's been there? Well, m- most, there aren't very many that are over 400 years old, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, I think, you know, just looking at how, how making is, uh, at the time silently took place, she looked like she was in her early 20s. And she was 294 years old. The reason that they appear that way is that blood is a very singular food source. You know, we eat all kinds of things, you know, like pizza and steak and salads and all of this stuff. But our bodies... Uh, you know, the percentage of our metabolism given to maintenance and repair is relatively small. In the third story, Macon fell into the clutches of these doctors that were studying her. And, you know, even after they zapped her with an x-ray machine and, uh, you know, had these other problems, it being in captivity, they found that her metabolic Uh, percentage was much much higher and I think a normal vampiric person in their normal resting state would be at least 95% maintenance and repair which is why they appear not to age you know they age just like we do but they appear not to age because they're thrown forward in a very aggressive metabolic uh, acceleration and regeneration cycle. So, so much more of their body is given to maintenance and repair. You know, the scripture says that the oldest man that ever lived was almost a thousand years old. So I think their lifespan potentially could be like up to 900 years, but most of them don't survive beyond 400. So do they have superhuman strength? And also do they heal quicker than most people yes they are now remember when i when i talk about this the the four aspects darkness Mm -hmm. gloominess clouds thick darkness that's sort of a continuum if you start with clouds and go to gloominess then darkness then thick darkness you see that it's getting more and more dark and so as you go deeper into it they do get stronger and you know their their features you know their capabilities change as they as you go into it Macon was changed on the darkness pathway uh thomas was exposed to her blood and he's changing on the darkness pathway also about midway through the storyline you meet a person who has changed on the thick darkness pathway and he's so different from anyone else that she's ever known. He's called the other. And yes, he is phenomenally stronger even than her. What are the others? Well, like I say, I called him the other because, like I say, she was so different from many things she had encountered before. Uh, and that's just what he was called. And, I, you know, I can't give give the storyline away and and tell you who he really is cuz that wouldn't be any fun for the readers. Right. But uh he he was changed on the thick darkness pathway and like I say I'm basically I'm going over Joel 2 
chapter 2, verse 2, I'm just reiterating that throughout the storyline, describing these different things. Well, who's Jeannie and why does she matter? Who is Janine? Uh, Janine, sorry. Okay. Um, in the second story, one of my one of my favorite people is Janine because uh, she is a vampiric girl that that realized. Uh, now she was stuck in what they call a blood cult, and a blood cult is where you have people that think that it's a good idea to drink blood because we're going to extend our lifespan with this. And she was stuck in this blood cult, but the blood cult leader had a little girl who Janine raised, and her name was Alicia. Still is. You know, Alicia is still with us. And so Janine raised Alicia as a from a little girl to about seven years old until she discovers that Nolan wanted to sacrifice his own daughter. And by sacrifice, that means put a knife to her throat and cut her throat and kill her. And so Janine loves Alicia, and that's not going to happen, so she takes Alicia and runs. And the major part of Rites of Passage, the second story, is Janine trying to stay out of Nolan's clutches. And eventually Thomas gets caught with Janine and Alicia and then making us to follow him to save his life. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't get there in time to save Janine's life. And, uh, you know, like I say, she Janine was a very, very godly girl that just got stuck. And she's just an amazing person also, I think. Well, is drinking blood a sin? I'm sorry, phone. Say that again. You're breaking up a little bit. Is drinking blood a sin? Yes. According to Scripture, drinking blood is a sin. Okay. So why did you kill all Jesus? I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, Why did you kill all Jesus? I think you're asking me, why did I write this? No, why did you kill her off? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I still still don't quite get it. I still can't quite hear you. Let me try this. Is that better? Yes, sir. It's better. Okay. Why did you kill off Janine? I didn't kill Janine. Nolan did. Okay. Why did he do it? Well, uh, Janine was going to kill him because of what he was going to do to Alicia, and he didn't give her the chance. Uh, He was just the kind of heartless person he was in the first place. Life didn't mean anything to him. Uh, When when Janine was looking at him, uh, Nolan had wished for this thick darkness because that's what the blood cult was covered with. And it's like his very essence got consumed with it. And he just hated anything living. And Janine was, uh, I guess he hated her. And he was frustrated and mad with her. He beat her uh, all the night before they killed her. You know, he was hitting her in the face and all while she was bound to this pillar thing. And so he was just carrying out his frustration and his anger with her, and uh, and he just did. Well, has your writing changed your perspective on reality? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sure I quite heard that. Help me again. Okay. Has your rural writing changed your perspective on reality? I guess I don't have the same view of reality as everybody else because I saw all this in the first place. Um, I I believe that I have to do what I have to do to, uh, 
you know, I treat all this as real. I know it's called fiction and I know it's a story, but I treat all this as real just in case it is because I have to keep um, my perspective and, you know, let people know what a vampiric person is and what they can do. It's sort of like, you know, you have a nuclear reaction and the reactor's going to blow up. And so they put these rods in it to slow the reaction down so the nuclear reactor doesn't melt down. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hoping my storyline is able to do for society because you will eventually find out that they really do exist. Mm -hmm. And when you find out they really do exist, you'll want to kill them. When you try to kill them, they will fight back. And that would be a very, very, very bad thing. And so the goal is not to go there with them. And so I'm hoping enough people will be standing and compassionate and aware enough not to do that. That's true. Well, what types of entities have you seen or confronted? And any entities that are not from our world? Well, certainly... Um, when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, now to explain to your listeners what that is, you know, as a Christian, you receive Jesus as Lord, and he becomes your Savior uh, because you receive what he did for you on the cross, and, you know, he becomes your Savior. But besides that, in the person of God, there's actually three persons. There's God the Father. God the Son, as we know him, is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, or more often called the Holy Ghost. Now, he's called the Holy Ghost because that's an old Anglo-Saxon term that means holy guest. Now, the same Holy Ghost that's in you when you get saved, he's also part of you when the power comes up and on you. It's not that you get any more of the Holy Ghost when you go through this experience, but the power comes up out of you and on you, sort of like a umbrella. And so when I received the Holy Ghost that night, I saw angels, I saw demonic spirits. Uh, one of the most interesting ones, uh, the girl that was leading my Bible college at the time, she was walking down the street and there were these two big angels following her. But, you know, they were glowing, but she was glowing more than they were. And they were like very large men, say about 10 foot tall. Uh, they had dark hair, but they did not have wings. But I knew they were angels. Well, what's your thoughts on parallel universes? Um, on what universe? Uh, parallel. Parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, don't have any thoughts about it, really. Do well, you, you think maybe some of these entities may have taken from there, or another dimension, or something? Well, I know that, like when you read the like the King James Bible, you see all these things in heaven, and mm -hmm. like the Book of Revelation. So the so the world is filled with beings. Hello, including the devil. He's a fallen angel and, you know, a darkened spirit. There's there's no light in him. So he's, he's just intent to uh, destroy man and cause the fall of mankind. You know, that's just his whole thing. Uh, he knows that his time is short, so he's getting even more uh, determined in these last days. But there's a whole range of spiritual beings uh, and things for manifestation. And, you know, since I'm aware of vampiric people in the first place, I think the world is much more multidimensional than we we on the human side have really believed. And so I really think a lot more is possible than we, we've let ourselves consider. Uh, but like I say, the... The reason that I do this storyline is because I want them to have a chance to live. Well, is this a Christian story? 
And no. how does that? Oh, okay. Uh, silently comes the whole silently series storyline mm-hmm. is a revelation of darkness and blood. Now, Macon is Macon becomes a Christian. Janine was a very godly girl. Uh, she was raised Catholic in a Catholic high school, uh, and so, you know, like I say, the people consider it a uh, a, a thing that you can't be a blood drinker and love God at the same time, but you're not considering the their body and what their body is forcing them to do. And so you just have, sort of have to give them a little grace in that area. Uh, each of the four stories of this storyline repeat the pattern of love, grace, compassion, and right with God. That Psalms 112.4. And I consider it far more uh, a God thing than, than me that each of these four story blocks repeats that pattern. For example, in Silently, Macon does love Thomas. And she realizes that as as John is pushing him on the rocks next to this cliff. I think what was most in her mind, the young man that she loved back in the day, when she became vampiric, I think, um, well, she just loved Thomas, and so love showed up. In the second story, uh, Janine has a lot of grace around her, in spite of being vampiric and having to run from Nolan and trying to keep Alicia alive. And Macon says over her as they are burying her, God is gracious. And I'm I'm not aware that there has ever been a story of vampiric people where that's been even mentioned as a possibility. In the third story, Macon is uh, trapped by these doctors, but her internist, Dr. Benjamin, he, he's a very good man. He's just being led by these others to keep her a captive. But he eventually sees her and understands, um, you know, that there's nothing in her condition that they could use to help people. And once he sees this and realizes that her situation is a closed system, uh, he has compassion on her and opens the seals of this container they kept her locked up in. And then, of course, in the fourth story, Thomas's sister is a very godly uh, 16-year-old, then turned 17. And so right with God will have to show up. And so I think it's far more a God thing that that love, grace, compassion, and right with God repeats in each of the four story blocks. Do you think it's possible that God can heal these people and let them live a long, long life? Uh, well, my definitive answer on that is, would have to be, I think with God, nothing is impossible, but I do not think that a vampiric person can be healed as the church tries to prescribe that. And so, uh, you know, I very, uh, humbly and reverently ask the church not to do that. Don't put them in that situation. Do not try to pray for their healing. It will not work. Well, why do you think God, this man, all the time with war, disease, and disasters, and death? I'm sorry. Something about war, disease, disasters, and death. Please help help me with that again. Yeah, why do you think God tests men with these disasters and events? Well, if I go to my back door and I stand out over my backyard and I start throwing corn seed everywhere, what's going to eventually happen? Can you say it again? I kind of missed that. 
Okay. Uh, if I go to my back door and I throw corn seed everywhere, all over my backyard, I'm eventually going to get corn, right? Mm-hmm. If I go to my back door and I throw tomato seed everywhere, I'm eventually going to get tomato. Mm-hmm. The, the way the world works is essentially a system of seed time and harvest powered by the aspect of God we call Yahweh or Jehovah. And so... Um, Things happen the way they happen because the seed was sown for it, uh, evidenced by the life of Job in the Old Testament. Job was not, the devil was not asking God for permission to test Job. The devil was coming before the presence of Yahweh, or we say Jehovah, to get Job's harvest, because angels are harvesters. So things happen the way they happen because we're living in a fallen world. The devil gets people to do his bidding and do his thing, and people sow seeds for disaster and hardship and all of this. And it's not God bringing it. It's us doing it to ourselves, although we don't know it. Well, is it true that while Jesus was dying on the cross, that God had to look away because he had become sin? Well, uh, the way that I interpret this is that Jesus knew that, um, well, there is a Jewish custom of a man marrying a woman and providing the tokens of her virginity, that is, she was pure before marriage. And in this Jewish custom, if a man marries a woman that he knows is not uh, pure, that he can pierce his own hands and his feet to provide the blood for her evidence that she was pure before marriage. In this Jewish custom, uh the the father would turn his back to the marriage bed and ask his son, is she pure? And the son would lay the tokens of her virginity outside of the marriage bed and said, yes, father, she's pure. And so when people commonly say that God can't look at sin because Jesus became sin, uh, I think possible that what he was doing was a... Um, you know that they that this was a pre-planned thing that Jesus was declaring us pure because his hands and feet were pierced with to provide the blood to show that we were pure although we are all harlot and he's marrying us cuz he loves us well how how's it possible that Jesus being sacrificed on the cross uh was to, you know, forgiven or died for every, everybody's sins, even before people are born and, and even sin. Well, his sacrifice, uh, you know, we had the uh, sacrifices of the lambs in the Old Testament leading up to his life and his ministry. Uh, there are five levels of authority in the earth, starting with God, man, angels, animals, plants. Well, in the garden, you know, man bowed his knee to an inferior being, a fallen angel, and so that reversed. Uh, Then it became God, a fallen angel, man, animals, and plants. And so the reason that a blood sacrifice would cover man's sin for a brief duration is because an animal is like an innocent and man was pushed down to the animal level you know because he traded places with a fallen being and so in essence all of that was pointing to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his sacrifice on the cross is uh, what paved you know his blood would paved the way for man for all eternity past present future all of that well who started sin and where did sin come from 
Uh, well, you know, the devil is the father of all of this because he uh, was a fallen being and he was in the garden. And Adam was supposed to, to tell his wife and train her, but he didn't tell her adequately because when the serpent, you know, the devil made a deal with the serpent and the serpent went to the woman to beguile her and tricked her and said, hath God said? And God didn't say, if you look at Genesis chapter 2, it's the Lord God that said. Whenever you see in Scripture the word God, capital G, little o, little d, you're typically looking at the word Elohim. And when you see the word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, you're typically looking at the word Yahweh, or as we say, Jehovah. When you see God, there's mercy available. When you see just the aspect of Jehovah, you get what harvest you're getting, pretty much. I mean, that's that's a trend. And well, so sin, that, sin uh, came from the devil, and man cooperated with it. Okay. Well, do vampires come from the devil? Uh, if so, should they be destroyed? And by whom? Man or God? Well, remember that people have Dracula on the brain. Mm -hmm. So I see a vampiric person. Now, when I say vampiric person, I mean a living person with a mind of their own a soul of their own, a life of their own. And so I think any person living can choose Jesus as Lord if they're in their right mind. But I do not think that, you know, remember that I'm trying to, to give you information about my children so that you better understand them. And so just killing them is not the way to do it. Although most people think that we're like in a holy war against the powers of darkness, but you don't see the people there. Well, your stories are dark. So how is it that you're trying to get these people into the light of God? Well, you know, God's love is available for anybody who say who will say, I will. Because we're in this dispensation of grace. Now, the church will be called away one day. And then, the gen I mean, the Jewish people will come up and, you know, they'll come back into their forefront. But as long as we're under this dispensation of grace, and while God can be found, then you need to find him while he can be found. And I'm not trying so much to drag these people into the light. I'm trying to get normal people to better understand what they are and how they think and what they'll do. And, you know, if you could even, if you can manage it to try to care about what happens to them because uh, your life is bound up in what happens to them. Okay. So who was the first vampire, and how did they become to be the first one? Okay, you're, you know, there, there are many avenues that people talk about how did all this start. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some role-playing games that people play that they can sort of practice being a vampire, and in these different things, uh, I've seen the theory that, uh, you know, Cain killed his brother and God cursed him by making him a vampire. And that's how they explain that all of this came about. But largely, I believe that, now remember my theory, we've had blood drinking people in the world uh, since even the Old Testament times. I think that the devil tied to the only thing that he could of power back in that day, which was the Levitical covenant, you know, the covenant of the sacrifice of the animals. Mm -hmm. 
which ties all of this to the Jewish people ultimately. Um, I think when you take something from the spirit world to the natural world, you have to anchor it in four places because four is stable in the physical world. Why does a table have four legs? Why does a car have four wheels, for instance? If you consider the wind as being symbolic of the spirit, you know you notice we have the anchor points north, south, east, and west. Mm-hmm. It's anchored in four points. And so, like I say, the, the aspect of darkness, clouds, gloominess, and thick darkness are its anchor points. Now, if it takes um, four anchor points, there's there's an aspect that people have come lately to uh, really look at, and that's called a total lunar eclipse. A total lunar eclipse is uh, when the Earth comes between, uh, I believe it's when the Earth comes between the sun and the moon, And the earth is outlined, if you were sitting on the moon looking at the earth, the earth is outlined like in a red, orange, fiery glow. Mm -hmm. If you were sitting on the moon looking at the earth, Uh, the moon appears to turn blood red, which is why they call it a blood moon. I think during the tetrads of blood moons that certain things were done in that darkness that, uh, you know, like you sow seed, if you throw corn on the ground, you get more corn. Uh-huh. There's a scripture that says that the Lord will create darkness. We're not talking about God creating darkness. It's the aspect of Jehovah that will take any seed sown and multiply it. So vampiric people came from the aspect of Jehovah from seeds of darkness that were sown over a long period of time that multiplied. And then after the physical changes were made, their lifespan started doubling. And so by the time we get to about the 1600s, uh, from about A.D. 100 through uh, A.D. Uh, 1100, the, the physical changes were anchored then from about 1100 to about 1600. Uh, their lifespan began increasing. The closest thing that I can find to our modern-day vampiric people in Jesus' day was the one, was the man, the Gadarene uh, demoniac in the tombs. He was cutting himself with stones, but he was so strong that he could break any chain that they bound him with. And so the vampiric condition, as far as I understand it, that's how far it had gotten in Jesus' day. But hmm. after Jesus died on the cross and rose again, the Old Testament covenant was infused with power and life. And that was used, sown with seeds of darkness, to cause the uh, uh, metabolic acceleration and uh, change that they change that they go through, the physical changes in their body. So largely the vampiric people we have today have uh, evolved through that time of darkness, through those seeds sown. Hmm. Well, how often does a vampire people need to feed on blood, and how much blood do they consume? Well, they have to drink blood almost every day or every other day. Uh, if you remember those uh, like pint size, half pint size milk containers we had in school, uh-huh. three or four of those would make a typical vampiric meal. If they're yeah. deprived of blood for longer than three days, which is a bad thing, their blood needs go up and they have to consume more blood. Um, so... It's best that they get it either every day or every other day. Okay. Well, you said that uh, vampiric is a 
medical condition uh, in the right store. Yes, so sir, I did. Is it true? Could it be possible that doctors could cure them of their hunger for blood? Well, I don't think doctors can fix it. I don't think um, the reason that I say that you can't pray for them and heal them is because there's a scripture that says faith worketh by love. And if you don't love, then there's nothing that that your prayer is going to grab onto because you don't love us in the first place. So, I mean, doctors can't fix it either because it's a, it's a massive physical reorientation of their entire body. So, uh, you know, doctors can't fix it either. Well, are their bodies cold to the touch? Now, uh, in the second story, a, a vampiric person's temperature is basically a few degrees below normal human temperature, mm-hmm. like about 96 or 97. They are not cold. Although in the second story, you know, Jean, Janine reports of being cold all the time. But the reason Janine was cold is because she came under the thick darkness of that blood cult, and her body felt cold to her, but it was not actually cold. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, as she was dying, uh, those demonic spirits were leaving her, and so her body felt warm to her at the very end. Are, are demonic spirits uh, attracted to the vampires? Now, I think when I'm describing a vampiric person, they are no more or less affected by demonic spirits than the general population. Say roughly 20%. Uh, So that means, uh, you know, 20% of the people sitting in church with you probably have a demonic spirit in their head or somewhere in their life. Uh, so vampiric people are no more or less affected by demonic spirits than uh, the general population. Any church that encounters a vampiric person, first of all, you know, see if you could be at least nice to them. Uh, do not disrespect them. Do not condemn them. Do not pray for their healing. You have to see them, love them. And, you know, try to be a, a little kinder than uh, most people would be. Because once you understand that they're literally stuck, it, it puts a whole other spin on their life and what they have to do to survive. But uh, cast out the demonic spirit because the church has that authority. Mm-hmm. Well, wouldn't humans, well, People that are not vampires, would they? Would you feel like they might be jealous because they can live so long? Uh, it's really the quality of life that matters. Um, a human can live on a respirator and have, uh, you know, that's not living. That's uh, being fed with a tube and living off of a machine. So there's something to be said for your quality of life. The way a vampiric person thinks is, I have to get blood today. I have to get blood tomorrow. Where am I going to get it? And this is all they have time to think about. It's not glamorous. It's not fun. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. It's not any of these things because your life largely comes down to, I have to get blood today. I have to get blood tomorrow. Where am I going to get it? Wow, that's a, that's a good point. Well, who's Alicia? Uh, Alicia yeah. is the daughter of the blood cult leader in the second story. Uh, Alicia, uh, remarkable little girl. You know, she she went through so much. And like I say, in the second story, Janine's battle 
to keep Alicia alive is what really rights is all about. And uh, she did survive. And thankfully, you know, Janine did what she could to keep Alicia alive. And thankfully she is. Wow. Well, have you achieved what you want to, to, that you're trying to accomplish with this storyline? And what comes well, next. I mean, we're we're just in the beginning of it, and uh, you know, I'm I'm thankful for even opportunities like this to speak on the radio publicly about it because I believe there's just so much that that I need to communicate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thankful with the the good start that I had when I wrote silently uh, starting in 1983. The first draft took me three years. I submitted silently to a like a little competition, and I won editorial help. And so with the editorial help, the rewrite of silently took me three more years. Uh, but after that, I couldn't seem to, to go forward either with the next story or with silently, so I went off and wrote other things. In 2010, the Lord was dealing with me in terms of picking this storyline back up again. And so in 2011, I went back through silently and re-rendered it, you know, changing some of the descriptions and directions and so forth and finished it. And then within the next year, I wrote Rites of Passage within a year. Wow. And it took me a little time to edit it. Because my friend who uh, helps me edit the first one, she had had uh, an incident where she hurt her arm. So she was in pain, so she couldn't help me. And so I had to learn to, uh, it's hard to edit your own work because you keep reading over the same thing and you miss it. But uh, I developed, uh, you know, through software and some other techniques some some ways that helped me finally edit my work. Uh, I had to learn to typeset. Uh, I had to learn, I had to cover, cover artist and all the things that went into making the uh, book form and the electronic uh, Kindle version. But like I say, I had to learn all this stuff and just sort of put it together myself. Well, can Van Parr People get blood from animals, and wouldn't it yes. be safer for them? Well, um, can drink animal blood for a little while, but it's qualitatively different than human blood. They invariably go back to uh, human blood a- as quickly as they can. Uh-huh. Well. When all is said and done with the storyline, what do you want to leave people with? Hope. Hope. I want people to have hope. And hopefully hopefully a grain of compassion. Well, that's that's true. The world needs a whole lot more of it. Like I say, it when you see them as people that are literally stuck in 19, I'm sorry, in 2002, I went away for a religious retreat called a walk to Emmaus. Uh, People who are familiar with that, this is an international organization and, uh, you know, different ministries and churches sponsor it. But what it is, you go away for a weekend retreat. You're sitting and listening to, 15 talks about the love of God, the grace of God, love of God, grace of God, all weekend long. Well, I went away on this retreat in the third night or morning. I had a vision. I was walking along this darkened landscape. It was very, very dark. And the only light that was available came from the skyline where it looked like it was outlined in red, like a fire was burning, Mm -hmm. like the glow from a hillside that's burning. 
and I thought I heard a gurgling sound that I first thought was water. But as I got closer, uh, I realized that there was a chasm cut in the earth in the darkness and that there were people down in the bottom of this chasm and there was a river of blood pulling them along. When I looked down there, uh, there was a young woman down there in the masses of people in this chasm, and she looked up at me, and when I saw her, I recognized her face. And so I started looking for something that I could use to, to lower into the chasm to get them out. I picked up this branch, and it sort of crumbled like it was burned and turned into ashes in my hand. So I took a few steps back and went for it. I took a jump off of the edge of that thing, and, and as I was falling down into the chasm, I woke up. Now, uh, you know, if I hadn't woke up, I would I would have been down there with them, and I, you know, right where I wanted to be. That that vision gave me a lot of peace concerning them. And it also helped me understand things about their their situation. Mm-hmm. Well, and that think... was on a we- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sir. That was on a weekend retreat uh, where where nothing was going on in my life except just to hear God. Hmm. Well, what do you think hell is like? Do you think it's like Dante's Inferno? Well, first of all, we know from the uh, rich man who died, he lifted up his eyes and he he found himself in this place that's hot, uh, literally hot. Uh, You know, the scripture says that, uh, you know, the worm dieth not and it's always, you know, hot there. The reason the, the, the place where hell exists is in a spiritual dimension in the center of the earth. Uh, In the fall of the first earth, Lucifer caused uh, the flood. That is the flood before Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. And in that, he destroyed the earth and all the life that was here. Now, there was not a man here. But when you come to Genesis chapter 2, or Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 uh, and God said light be he's really talking about the recreation of the earth after Lucifer's fall the way I see it and so Lucifer uh, sowed for this uh, place in the center of the earth to be his prison and when God said light be and regenerated the planet from the fall of Lucifer uh, the inside of the earth turned into fire. And so hell ex- hell exists today on a spiritual plane in the center of the earth, and it's hot there because the center of the earth is molten. At the end of all of this, uh, those that are not Christians are cast into what they call the, the lake of fire. And so uh, there, there's a separate place of damnation prepared for the devil and his angels, it wasn't made for people. But like I say, if you line up your entire life with the devil, you go with him. Or if you live your entire life for God, you go with Jesus. Yeah, because her son passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Uh huh. And and uh, uh, he he visits her, and she sees him in heaven. And she says everyone's there because uh, she don't think it's the judgment. It's like uh, how to explain. I think I think what you're asking me is whether this young man went to hell or not. Is that what you're asking? No, no, I don't think that's what I'm asking. I think that's where I'm going with it in a little bit. It's that. Uh, can everyone go to heaven before they Well, anyone that accepts, well, first of all, uh, I believe the scripture as we read it in the King James Bible is the version that, that is real. 
people have their ideas about God and the devil promotes all of that because he wants everybody to believe that any which way you go religious-wise, you'll get to heaven. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The reason that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, uh, man is a spirit. You know, you you remember like in Genesis, uh, God created the man. He created the man's spirit first because God is a spirit. So man is a spirit. Then he put the man's spirit inside this earthen body that he created. So man has a physical body. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. So man has a soul. A soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So man is three parts. Spirit, soul, which is mind, will, and emotions, and your physical body. Uh, If an angel walked in the room where you were sitting and wanted to shake your hand, an angel is a spiritual being, right? If you tried to shake hands with an angel, your hand would go right through theirs because spirit to flesh is not uh, solid. Now, if he goes to heaven, you know, his on the spiritual dimension, if there's a spiritual, if there's a door there, he has to go through the door, just like we do. But if he's in our dimension, he could walk through the walls and anything, because spirit to physical here is not solid. But the trick that you have, uh, you are a spirit that lives inside a body. The part of you that keeps your spirit inside your body is your blood. Because you notice that if you lose your blood, your spirit and your body and your soul separate. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the scripture says of him that, uh, you know, Adam was the first Adam that was earthy and sensual. And the last Adam, Jesus, came from heaven. Jesus was born with perfect blood, just like Adam had before he sinned. According to the laws of seed time and harvest, a perfect, blood-filled man lost it all. So according to the laws of seed time and harvest, a perfect, blood-filled man had to win it all back. And so Jesus' blood was perfect. That is, he never sinned. And according to the scripture, uh, the Holy Ghost is given to us as our seal that we belong to God. And so the reason that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is because it takes our blood and our body to keep our spirit here, but it takes perfect blood from Jesus to bind the Holy Spirit to us. And so that's why he's the one, he, that's why he's the only way. Okay. Well, here's a question I like to ask all my guests. Uh, have you had any experiences uh, such as uh, crypto, you know, like a Bigfoot or something like that, or a UFO encounter? No, I haven't. Uh, you know, I I guess I consider this my area of expertise. So, like I say, uh, I, I'll talk about vampiric all day long, but I don't know anything about Bigfoot. <laughs> That's all right. I like that. I just like to ask people that because uh, you'd be surprised of the people that would actually say, "Yeah, I think about my critics play." <laughs> well, what else do you uh, you plan on uh, writing? Well, the rest of the storyline is certainly uh, uh, the next three stories. Uh, let's see, the first two, silently comes the night, rites of passage. The next two stories are with with Deadly Intent and Overkill. With Deadly Intent, John returns. And you, what I want to do is important to me is, is show what made him the vampiric killer you met in Silently. 
uh, in the second, in overkill, Macon is dragged back into a situation that she had before silently, and Kimberly is involved, and Kimberly is in danger. Kimberly is uh, Thomas's sister, younger sister. And in Macon's story, which is the first historical story, goes back to the beginning when Macon was attacked, uh, lost most of her family. Um, but like she told Thomas in the Wright story, she had to choose to live. Uh, she told Thomas, you have to choose life or you will die. And so Macon herself chose life back uh, in about, I think it was about 1712 or so when she was attacked. She was only she was on, almost 14 years old. And so, like I say, she uh, a very very young girl, um, and it was just bad. But she survived. Well, that's great. So what's your plans for the rest of 2017? Well, um, uh, interestingly enough, about a week from now, I'm going to go to New Orleans. Uh, I haven't been in New Orleans for many, many years, and I'm very excited about the trip. Uh, during the time of with deadly intent starts from the 1st of October and goes to about the 11th of November. And so actually I will be in New Orleans at the time John uh John is the vampiric killer in the first story for those people that haven't seen it yet. So mm -hmm. John is returning and he's hunting Macon, but Macon is not in New Orleans where he expects her to be. She's been in this accident and is stuck in Odessa, Texas. So John has has acquired two serial killers, uh, helpers, and he's hunting Macon in New Orleans, but she's not there. And I will be in New Orleans in about a week. And I'm excited because it's my opportunity to actually be there in about the time that uh, deadly, the events with, with deadly intent took place. Because I'm excited about that. Oh, I bet. Well, do you have a website or uh, you know any way okay. people can give any questions now, or thoughts or comments or anything to get a copy of your books? Okay, uh, there is another Douglas Robinson who writes, but if you search for my name and look for the Silently series storyline. Uh, you should find the books on Amazon or Kindle. Uh, my website had a minor issue. It may be back up now, but it is HTTPS. It's a secured website. Uh, colon slash slash silently, S-I-L-E-N-T-L-Y dash publishing dot com. I have uh, information about the storyline. I have excerpts from the stories. I have information in my downloads areas, like like if any church or ministry is interested in vampiric people, uh, you know, what to do and not do when you're dealing with a vampiric person. Like there's a real person that can walk in your door and stick their hand out and shake your hand and say, hello, I'm here. You have to know what to do and not do when dealing with someone like this. So well, please, please do that. Well, I may know somebody. Somebody that might be able to help you. Cool. That's in the church. I can send the information uh, to what's your name, Kimberly? Nicole. Please, and, please uh, do. And uh, let her hook you up. Uh, I gave uh, Nicole a, you know, vampire ministry little handout that uh -huh. describes all the different kinds of, uh, you know, the human vampire side of it, as well as the, you know, my children. So, uh, like I say, there's there's resources on my website, and there's uh, things that I've given to Nicole that uh, anybody that wants to uh, learn it. Can, can contact her and get it. 
I'll say I will. Well, thank well, you. Doug, so that, that's Doug. very generous. Oh, I, any way I can help uh, any of my guests, I, I'm more than happy to do it. <laughs> but uh, Douglas, I appreciate you coming on the show, and uh, I, everything it, it just blows my mind. Well, thank you, sir. You've been very, uh, very diligent and very well prepared host, I must say. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, and I apologize for the tech technical difficulties the first time. <laughs> it's okay. That was so embarrassing. I'm sitting here trying to get a, uh, everything hooked up, and I'm like, "What is going on?" <laughs> uh, I understand I, technical. I really do. <laughs> well, 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 Douglas, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. And anytime you want to come back, doors always open. Well, thank you, sir. I'm so honored to be here, and thank you for having me. Oh, it's an honor having you, sir, and you have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for us tonight. I want to thank Douglas Robinson for coming on the show, and thank everyone that took the time to listen in. I'd like to give a big shout-out to the Vibe Net- Radio Network. Sorry, people, I can't talk for shit tonight. And to Holly and Ryan for putting up with us. Also to all the first responders uh, and the men and women of the armed service. Thank you for your service. Our guest for next Thursday night, October 26th, will be our well. Shoot, sorry. I tell you, I am wore out. It's been a long day. Uh, It will be our Halloween special with our two guests, Maggie White and Chris Papa Coyote, Oster Workers. Oh, shit, I'm just tearing it up. I'll get it right by next week. Discussing Halloween and its origins. Uh, tune in next week to another exciting show at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Got it right. So everyone have a good weekend and a good night. Let's play some music. Lord, I'm tired of that.
On the first night of Halloween, three witches gave to me some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the second night of Halloween, three witches gave to me two zombie eyeballs and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the third night of Halloween, three witches gave to me three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the fourth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs from a haunted graveyard. On the fifth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the sixth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me six vampires fighting five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the seventh night of Halloween, three witches gave to me seven werewolves howling, six vampires fighting five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the eighth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me eight mummies waking, seven werewolves howling, six vampires fighting five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the ninth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me Nine goes a haunting, eight mummies waking, seven werewolves howling, six vampires fighting, five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the tenth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me Ten goblins glowing, nine goes a haunting, eight mummies waking, seven werewolves howling, six vampires fighting, five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the eleventh night of Halloween, three witches gave to me eleven bats of flying, ten goblins glowing, nine goes a haunting, eight mummies waking, seven werewolves howling, six vampires fighting, five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the twelfth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me Twelve coffins creaking, eleven bats of flying, ten goblins glowing, nine goes a haunting, eight mummies waking, seven werewolves howling, six vampires fighting, five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. On the thirteenth night of Halloween, three witches gave to me Thirteen cauldrons bubbling, twelve coffins creaking, eleven bats of flying, ten goblins glowing, nine goes a haunting, eight mummies waking, seven werewolves howling, six vampires fighting, five creepy dolls. Four headless horsemen, three giant spiders, two zombie eyeballs, and some bones from a haunted graveyard. Don't tell the witches, but I don't know where to put all this stuff.
was working in the lab late one night When my eyes beheld an eerie sight For my monster from his slab began to rise And suddenly, to my surprise He did the monster man It was a graveyard smash It caught on in a flash He did the monster mash From my laboratory in the car police To the master bedroom where the vampires teased The ghouls all came from their humble abodes To get a jolt from my electrodes They did the monster mash It was a graveyard smash It caught on in a flash They did the monster mash The zombies were having fun The party had just begun The guests included Wolfman Dracula and his son The scene was rocking All were digging the sound Igor on chains Back by his baying hound The coffin bangers Were about to arrive With the vocal group The crypt kicker the monster mash It was a graveyard smash We had caught on in a flash They played the monster mash Out from its coffin Drac's voice did ring Seems he was troubled by just one thing Opened the lid and shook his fist and said Whatever happened to my Transylvania twist? It's now the Monster Mash, and it's a graveyard smash. It's caught on in a flash. It's now the Monster Mash. Now everything's cool, Jack's a part of the band. And my Monster Mash is the hit of the land. For you, the living, this mash was meant to. When you get to my door, tell them what it's been to. Then you can monster mash And do my graveyard smash You'll catch on in a flash Then you can monster mash Blackwater had a lift back in the swamp where strange green reptiles crawl. Snakes hang thick from the cypress trees like sausage on a smokehouse wall. Where the swamp is alive with a thousand eyes and all I'm watching you. Stay off the track of Hattie Shack in the back of the black bayou. Way up the road from Hattie Shack lies a sleepy little Okeechobee town. Talk a swamp with your Hattie, lock you in when the sun go down. Rumors of what she done, rumors of what she do. Kept folks off a track of Hattie Shack in the back of the black bayou. Brought the rain, the rain stayed on, and the swamp water overflowed. Skeeters and the fever grabbed the town like a fist. Doc Jackson was the first to go. Some said the plague was brought by Hattie. There was talk of a hanging too. But the talk got shackled by the howls and the cackles from the bowels of the black bayou. Where hope run dry In the square there was found A big black round fat Full of gurgling brew Whispering sounds As the 
folks gathered round. It came from the black bayou. There ain't much pride when you're trapped inside a slowly sinking ship. Scooped up the liquid deep and green, and the whole town took a sip. Fever went away, and the very next day the skies again were blue. Let's thank old Hattie for saving our town. We'll fetch it from the Black Bayou. Party of ten of the town's best men headed for Hattie Shack. Said Swamp Witch magic was useful and good, and they're going to bring Hattie back. Never found Hattie, and they never found the shack, and they never made a trip back in. Watch my note they found tacked to a stump, said don't come looking again. 